Sweet Pete is welcomed by two former Tigers, Butch Van Brennikoff and Senator Bill Bradley. complaining about their, not, their inability to talk. My goodness, all afternoon, I am nervous. Somebody was telling some tall tales there, I guess. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, we got a couple guys there that their nickname should be LP, Long Plain. Long Plain how? Long Plain. My goodness. Uh, well, I have generally three speeches I give. I don't know if I should give any of these. They don't apply. One is Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia. I, 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 that's not going to go too good here. The second one I give is uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. I don't think they like that either. Right? The, the dilemma wrapped around a mystery, right? Well, so I got to do something. Let me just start out by saying that uh, no one ever starts out wanting to be a Hall of Fame coach or a Hall of Fame doctor or a Hall of Fame anything. You know, no one ever starts out that way. There are a lot of forces at work, you know, in that. And you don't you don't know where you're going to end up. Some guys don't end up too hot, and some guys do very well, and we know that. Right? You don't know why it happens sometimes. Sometimes it's just circumstance. You know, I, I think of uh, this great poem about the, the, the Titanic and how when they built the ship, it was such a great ship and steel all over the place, so strong, well built, last forever. And while somebody was making this darn beautiful ship, somebody else was making the iceberg. And then, bang, one of them had to give. That's called circumstance. Right here next to me are the two guys that did something for Princeton. Princeton was always halfway decent in basketball. They were pretty good. They had an old guy there named Cappy Capon who did a beautiful job, and everybody loves him there as he should. But they were just average. And then in came Bill Bradley. And then in came Bill, my brother called. And they put this school on the map, basketball-wise, for five years for them, or four, actually, five years for coach, and 30 for me, and now for Billy one. So 36 years, where it's been very good, and a national school basketball. And I don't think anything's going to happen to change that. Now, I was born and raised in, in the hometown of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There were about, I don't know how many hundreds of Spaniards came over from Spain to work in the steel company. And the steel mill, Bethlehem Steel, at that time was the second largest steel company in the world. So everybody's proud of that. It's about four miles long, goes from one end of the town to the other. We love, lived right across the street from the drop forge. It was banging. All night long, you heard that thing. And my father was a good guy. He had to, he, he drank a little bit too much. And so what happened was that my father had, had problems with my sister, had to raise him and me. She's so sitting down there, good gal, just retired from teaching after 70 years. All right. Or are you just 70? Well, anyway, she's done a heck of a lot more than I ever did, and nobody knows about it. Well, it was a great time to live, right? You know, Miniver Chibi was that guy, Edward Arlington Robinson used to write about. He 
he was always unhappy about where he was. He'd bewail the seasons, stuff like that. Unhappy anywhere. I, I, I look at it just, you know, I was lucky to be where I was at the time that I was there doing what I was doing. The war was going on, so it was a hard time for you to be a jerk. You couldn't, you couldn't be a jerk in those days. All of your idols went off to war. One of them was Chuck Roderick, the most famous athlete from the city of Bethlehem. Hardly anybody knows that he was a gunner on an airplane for 25, 26 missions. Some didn't come back. I went to a great school. At a time when you, you knew why you were in school. You had to pay attention to your teachers so you could learn. And I ran into a coach, my first great influence, Joseph Prelitz. About 40 years ahead of his time, we were zone pressing, full court band for man, 1-3-1 one, one zone. Uncharacteristically, we took over 100 shots a game. I mean, something happened to me somewhere along the way. I don't know what it was. But he was great. And when he, your report card, you did A's and B's, you didn't get an A or a B, he'd grab you by the ear. Mine seemed to have shown his actions. Uh, he just yank on your ear and get you down to the floor to your crying, and then he'd calmly say to you that you're not supposed to get a C. Didn't I tell you? Well, it was just great all around guys, smart as heck. Of course, that was before the American Civil Liberties Union. Now that poor fellow would uh, you know, get sued like crazy. Now, nobody ever heard of that guy. I mean, although he's so great. And I don't know if there's a high school coach in here. If there's a high school coach in this audience, let me tell you something. If you're good at what you're doing, you're the salt of the earth. Because after you do what you do, hardly anything needs to be done. I hope you're like that. On the other hand, if you're no good, it's caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> now I ran into my next guy right here, Coach Rambretikoff. Everybody calls him Butch. I never call him that once. Right? I don't like when they call him Butch. Well, I hadn't been doing so well at Lafayette at the time. I was, I was a little wild, you know, coming from the streets of South Bethlehem. Good pool shooter, good you know, stuff like that. And what happened was that he was worried that I was too little to play. And when he got the job, he heard this captain was 5'6". And then when he looked at the stat sheet and saw that I led the team in rebounds, defensive rebounds, he got upset. Well, what he did was great for me. I don't think he even understands it yet. Taught me how to think. Right? Because anybody can coach basketball. I can tell you that right now. It's not that hard to know about a pick and roll, back pick, for the shuffle cut, all that. I mean, how, that's not that hard. Right? But what is hard is to see how you can think about something, how you can develop something, how you can uh, have some kind of idea how your team is going to play. And that comes under the heading of thinking. I, I thought it was anyway. That's what he did. And you know from your own experience, no matter what you do, that the way you think affects what you see. The way you think affects what you see. Think about it yourself. I hope you're paying attention. Yeah, it would do you a lot of good. <laughs> and what you see affects what you do. Think, see, do. Because some guys look at something and don't see anything. Or some guys try to shove something down a hole that's too small for what they're trying to do. So I think I was grateful to him for that and gave the me all the confidence in the world. I'll never forget him for that. And you know what he's done as a coach himself. And 
I'm not a lobbyist, but who knows whether he's not going to be here himself. So then I got a coach at Easton. Easton High School, small town football town in Pennsylvania. Six guys showed up for practice the first night, and the, the guy, the manager of the team is now the head of Gannett Newspapers, Jack Curley, comes up to me and says, would you please turn on the lights? As J.B. coached I said, what? He said, aren't you the janitor? That's how I started my career. Well, Thanksgiving Day showed up, all the football players came out, I cut four of the six guys that were there, went on to win, all right? I went to Reading, that's a basketball town there, they love basketball there. The superintendent of school says to me, you know, you, uh, you, you've got a good reputation as a teacher. I hate to tell you this, but if you don't win, I'm going to have to fire you. Seems like you had everything passed backwards, I think, right? Well, I went to Lehigh then, after I tried for a couple of jobs, didn't get them. And only three guys applied for the job. Lehigh has a wonderful little school. I had a happy year there. And three guys wanted the job. It was so bad, they hadn't won but five winning season in 60 years, three. They gave it to somebody else. That day he took another job, so that's down to two. The third guy was a high school coach from Wisconsin. They couldn't afford to fly him in, so I got the job. <laughs> so you talk about her circumstance. It's unbelievable. Well, coach goes out to coach the LA Lakers and they're looking for a guy to go to Princeton. That's where I spent most of my life as a coach, 29 years. Happy years, successful years. And I had there three great presidents, three, they're wonderful. Each guy, you learn from everything. If you're, if you're paying attention to what the hell's going on, you're gonna learn from everything, from everyone. Because sometimes the guy that's teaching you something is bad, so you'll just do the opposite. And sometimes the guy's damn good and you'll know it, and you'll do what it, what it takes there then. First guy said, you don't want you to be more than 85% right. How, how much, when a guy tries to be 100% right, he's gonna lie and he's gonna do everything to make sure he gets to be 100% right. 85% right's enough for him. I love that. We had a president damn near destroyed the country because he wanted to be 100% right. I mean, that's a good point. I, I followed that a lot. The next guy is here tonight, Bill Bowen, he's a wonderful guy. So Princeton's known as the elitist school, you know, elitist. We were 10th in the country just recently as an athletic school and tied for first as a top rated school in the country. But he defined the lead the way I like to define it, as being real good at what you're doing for a long time. Not by word of mouth or perception or by polls, but by what you do, by your works, it was a great definition of elitism. Sitting at that table is a stonemason, Tony Trani, that's the best stonemason in the world. I got another guy, Georgie Buck and Fusa, has been working there for 35 years and the grass is always cut, the buildings are always clean. That guy is elitist also, right? And then I have my players. They're here, a whole bunch of them. And I had an impact on it. I had to. You have to, when you're a coach, you have to have an impact on your players. You, you must do that. But the more I taught them, the more they learned, the more I learned from them. Which is a secret of life. You're always learning something. If you pay attention. And I learned from them. And I would say to them also, and I say this to you, I don't care how good you are or how much talent you have in whatever you're doing. If you don't work, you'll never get there. You'll not, you'll not reach the fullest extent of what that means. And I don't care how smart you are, because I had them there, real smart. And if you don't listen, you'll never be as smart as you should be. Intelligence and work, same thing. So there's something that has to be shared here, the joy that I have. I mean, there are people here that are happy about this, more happy about this than I am. I have to go to work for three days. 
And I want to share whatever it is that's worthwhile sharing with them because you can't. No man is an island. No one stands alone. We've been through that for about 50 years now. And I want to make sure that they know that. I'm grateful for that. And I had all these great assistants that I know I taught a lot to. But they taught me something too. And never once did I ever turn my back to find out what they were doing because I knew what they were doing was the right thing. And finally, I'm going out to Sacramento in three days. I'm an assistant coach there. My, my new mentor played for me, Jeff Petrie. He has a statement where he says that tomorrow is promised to no one. It's a heck of a statement. So that when I come in there with my ring, and I tell a guy to drive a little harder to the basket, I'm sure it will have a significant impact. <laughs> right. Right. Or when I tell him that I'm a Hall of Fame coach, well, I don't know if that's going to mean too much. So thank you very much. You've been very kind to listen to all of us. We were only supposed to talk three minutes. Whatever happened to the rules here, <laughs> you're going to have to put a clock here or something or something to go underneath the feet that when you go beyond a certain amount, it's just a little buzz and blows you right out of the gym. Like, all right? Anyway, thanks an awful lot. Like.